So hello everybody and welcome to this HVT Research Exchange webinar on developing climate resilient transport. My name is Gary Hack and I'll be the moderator for this session. Uh, but before we start, uh, we'd just like to have some housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded. Presentations will be shown in the webinar. If you would like a live transcription, you can do so by clicking on the button below your uh, Zoom screen, um, CC, closed caption. To make a comment, we ask you to use the Q&A feature. And we also would like to ask you not to use the chat function while people, the speakers are speaking because this can be disruptive for those who are using a screen reader. Following the webinar, we will send you a link of the video and a summary of the key points discussed. This webinar is part of the outreach activities of the high volume HVT Applied Research Programme. The HVT programme is funded by UK Aid and is undertaking research into sustainable transport development in low income countries in Africa and South Asia. And the focus, as I said, of this research exchange is climate resilient transport. So let's start. The scientific evidence is clear. Climate change is a threat to human well being and the health of the planet. Any further delay in global action will miss the brief window of opportunity to secure a livable future. We know that transport is a major contributor to climate change and is responsible for a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. And transport emissions are growing faster than any other economic se sector. Now the impacts of climate change will be magnified in cities where more than half of the world's population live. And although action on adaptation has increased, we are now we need to adapt faster um, to, to climate change if we have any chance of surviving and protecting transport infrastructure and our mobility. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, we need to move towards climate resilient development. And that requires reducing climate risk by adapting to climate change, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by taking mitigation measures, achieving the sustainable development goals and enhancing biodiversity. Developing more climate resilient transport will require solutions that involve marginalized groups, that prioritizes equity and justice, and that is able to reconcile differences between worldviews and interests. Now this HVT program is contributing to more climate resilient transport by providing knowledge and capacity building through its various activities. Today, we'll be hearing about two HVT projects that consider climate adaptation and mitigation in the transport sector. After the two presentations, there'll be an opportunity for questions. Our first presentation will be given by Dr. Andrew Quinn, reader in atmospheric science and engineering at the University of Birmingham. And now Andrew will be presenting highlights from a policy guide on climate resilient transport. So I'll pass over now to Andrew. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, and I shall share my screen. So hopefully everyone can see my slides there. And uh, thank you for that introduction, Gary. So I would also like to um, share the spotlight with my, my team uh, and say um, a thanks to Robin uh, and the team at TRL, uh, my own team at, here in Birmingham and uh, our excellent uh, editor, uh, Karen and uh, graphic designer, uh, Tim, who has uh, been able to provide a lot of wonderful input and which uh, I'll show you a little bit of later on. So the project I'd like to talk about is supporting adaptation for transport resilience with a particular focus on Africa and South Asia. And uh, what our aim was in this project was to increase the resilience of all types of, of transport infrastructure uh, with regard to climate change. And really underpinning that are four key research themes, one of which is about highlighting future weather patterns uh, to stakeholders, um, 
understanding climate change impacts and helping uh, local stakeholders to understand uh, the knock-on impacts to then to society and economy. Uh, transport resilience and infrastructure adaptation, so picking out those key points that Gary highlighted in his introduction about the need for mitigation, but also for adaptation, and where in fact we, we found the greatest need and therefore where we concentrated a lot of, of this work was in the capacity building uh, and uh, to some extent the financing of projects to do with adaptation. So from the project we've, we've got three key deliverables, um, a state of knowledge report which sums up where we are, uh, the main findings of which I will, I will come to in a moment, uh, the policy guide which I will outline the structure of uh, in the second part of my talk, and a, a research article which is currently under review for publication. And we were able to present some of these findings at COP26, and we had a very interesting discussion at, at COP26 about um, this work, which has been fed into the policy guide as well. So, in the state of knowledge report, we were we were looking at uh, all of the different um, national adaptation plans and the NAPAs, uh, which have been put forward by particularly uh, developing countries in Africa and South Asia. And so we analyzed 18 of these uh, countries own statements about their own uh, development and their own steps towards adaptation. And we used a multi-criteria analysis based on ISO 1490, uh, which is the international standard for adaptation uh, and resilience development. Um, what we found was that um, although these uh, different plans had different levels of maturity, uh, only a very few of them actually discussed transport as a sector. Um, and although their national and regional vulnerability assessments are, are actually quite uh, well developed, there are certainly major gaps within the monitoring and the evaluation of the kinds of projects which are being undertaken and how they're improving the resilience of transport infrastructure. So we can talk about um, an understanding of where the countries are in their context, uh, they can recognize that transport underpins many other different elements of their national infrastructure, um, but they don't necessarily identify um, transport as a specific element to be developed in terms of adaptation uh, and support for resilience. And so we looked more widely again, and we see that these are uh, developing plans. And a lot of the plans which were previously uh, NAPAs, so they were, they were more sort of um, starting points for this national adaptation planning framework. We are in recent years seeing many more of these being turned into fully fledged um, national adaptation plans. So there is good progress in this area in terms of developing national commitments to both mitigation and adaptation. But we still have this challenge that adaptation is, is very much playing second fiddle to mitigation. And that is of concern because, of course, the development of infrastructure takes quite some time. And therefore, it's important that the lead time that's necessary uh, is given to developing these projects before they become critical to the survival of the infrastructure within the country. A second element of our analysis of the current state of knowledge was looking at the different tools that are available. Now, some of these tools have been developed locally. Others of them have been developed by uh, international donors or by multinational organizations. Um, and there are quite a number of these different tools for assessing adaptation need or opportunities in different ways. And so, uh, some of these tools are very broad brush and they're trying to pick up all of the different aspects. Uh, some of them are much more specific and focused on a particular type of adaptation or a particular type of infrastructure or a particular part of the process of developing the resilience 
uh, planning through the, the national adaptation process. So um, some of these tools therefore do not support all the parts of adaptation planning. And some of them are very good at different scales. So some of them are very local, some of them are more uh, regional or national. And they therefore need differing levels of skill and local knowledge to be able to use them effectively. And so uh, what we found was, was therefore a very mixed bag, if I sum it up in, in one uh, phrase. We find that a lot of these tools are not necessarily uh, easy to pick up whether they're the most suitable tool for a particular purpose. Um, and some of them don't necessarily fit with the capacities of local uh, knowledge and understanding within uh, these developing country context. So it's important to understand what the different tools are and how they can be used. In addition to that kind of literature review and understanding of the context, we also undertook uh, stakeholder work with um, interviews. And uh, here we built up uh, quite a bank of knowledge about uh, where different stakeholders' interests and knowledge lay. And so we found that climate awareness, climate being the key word here, is still in its infancy across many of the stakeholders that we spoke to. Whereas the kind of immediate weather impacts are, for example, flooding uh, and the effects of, on bridges and roads, that is quite, quite well recognized. Um, and often the design specification of new projects is well understood and, and talked about a great deal, um, but these design specifications are often not localized and, and often don't have necessarily the background, the climate understanding built into them so that they will be resilient to future climates as well as today's climate. So we identified there a priority aware, uh, need for building climate awareness within uh, the work that we were doing. The necessary data to underpin these kind of decisions was also quite disaggregated. <clears throat> so we, we found that we needed to, uh, we talked to people about their need for data and often they talked about averages rather than extreme values. Um, and the local uh, context of COVID has had an impact on this and people's ability to gather the data that they need. Um, we also, if we think more broadly about uh, the impacts of climate change and uh, the impacts of developing transport infrastructure on things like biodiversity, so the sort of the, the, the knock on impacts then we also need to raise the awareness associated with those as well. And a key point that came out time and time again was that people were often trying to tackle these problems within their own uh, particular ministry or particular area of expertise. And so there was, there was again a, a sense that we needed to help join people up so that they were able to uh, talk to others who could then support and produce a better overall result by working together. <clears throat> so we identified from our state of knowledge report, from our interviews, that there were some key elements that we wanted to take forward, um, particularly government coordination, uh, both from the local level up to the national level and also across different sectors and ministries. Again and again, this question of uh, capacity building and awareness raising was, was flagged. And that can be around climate data, but it can also be about all the other different aspects of trying to pull together a successful project for adaptation. So that could be to do with linking it to disaster risk reduction. It can be due to do with financing of projects. Uh, it can be do to do with stakeholder engagement. And that stakeholder engagement was really a third point that we pulled out. Um, so needing to involve local communities, needing to involve the private sector in order to get this buy in, this support, this awareness of why these things were necessary and what the value was of really getting them right in the first place. Um, so what I'd now like to do is just uh, take you through some of the key points from the policy guide that we developed as a result. 
Um, and these are the, in the form of some key graphics that we, we produced. So this first graphic shows uh, both the direct and indirect uh, targets associated with delivering climate adaptation. So it's really to highlight to governments and ministries that there is much more to this in terms of sustainable development goals than just simply improving the transport system. It really highlights that transport is something which enables many other benefits in terms of uh, health and well-being, uh, trade and, and all sorts of other goals that one might have, um, both in terms of sustainable development and as a national and regional government. So it helps to underline this point of it being an underpinning aspect. We also wanted to raise awareness of the different types of events that cause transport disruption. And therefore we, we have this graphic, which shows the different types of extreme weather, which can cause problems and the kinds of ways in which they do cause problems. So we see a number of different modes of transport. Uh, we see the kinds of extreme weather events uh, not just changes in the average weather, uh, which is <clears throat> very important to highlight. Uh, and we begin to show people that uh, all of these extremes are possible and therefore uh, they are all something to think about when you're planning what you need for a climate adapted uh, infrastructure. And then finally, we come to four graphics which highlight the circular nature of planning and development for adaptation. So in the top right hand corner of this slide, you can see a circle and this was our, our linkage to show that this is a, uh, a process, a decision support process, which will help, but is something that needs to be repeated over time. And it shouldn't be a special project, it should be something which is built into the development of national infrastructure uh, in all sorts of different ways. So the first thing is to look at all of the modes together to involve stakeholders and to think about different scales. So they're right the way from the local scale up to the global scale, and to consider all of the different hazards that might be important in the future, not just today. The second uh, slide shows the need to develop an understanding of the data that's available and to highlight that the, the variety of different data which is available to people. People often weren't aware of the depth of the data that is available to them. So understanding the past and the future climate, understanding the vulnerability of transport infrastructure and understanding what the local context of that is and therefore how developing it and how making it more resilient will actually be of benefit to the people who use it. And then using that information to do a risk analysis that allows a proper set of priorities to be developed. So obviously you can't fix everything immediately. So it's important to start developing ideas for what is the highest priority? What is the, the best way in which we can engage with this? Having developed some priorities, we move on to the third slide, which is about considering the options of what can be done. And so often I, in my experience, have seen the development of options which have basically been pre-prepared rather than considering a greater range of options of what could be done. And this means engaging again with stakeholders of many different types and thinking about the benefits Transport infrastructure often has a maintenance cycle associated with it. Incremental change is a very powerful tool for improving the adaptation and resilience of infrastructure in the transport sector. It's not necessary to build new infrastructure all of the time. So it can be an incremental process. We need to think about uh, very simple ways in which uh, the infrastructure can be made more resilient through other aspects of planting trees or using uh, other methods, employing local uh, skills and local knowledge in order to improve the situation, rather than Im immediately assuming that we need massive investment in every problem. And so we can really be creative about developing the knowledge and the understanding and the resources uh, in order to get things right. 
And the other point that I'd like to make associated with this and which we make in the policy guide is that these decisions are not made in isolation. It's very important to have a plan, not just for the immediate future, but also for the longer term. And the immediate decisions that are taken should not block the longer term future of what's needed. So the development of what we call an adaptation pathway, whereby the current decisions are something that people can build on in the future as the situation changes and as perhaps unexpected uh, climate changes happen in the local area. So things should be helped to, to set a firm foundation for the future rather than setting uh, goals and targets and, and projects which then have to be um, limiting for the future or then have to be taken out in order to be replaced for the future. And then of course, implementing those options is something which is of key importance. And here is where we bring in the need for considering uh, secure funding for projects, but also thinking about how it fits into the wider uh, landscape of sustainable development for the local area, for the region and for the national economy. And a key point about this is that it is a circular cycle. These implemented changes need to be evaluated, they need to be monitored into the future. And as we go into the future, we say that you, people should go back and review these um, changes and think about doing this plan probably once every five years uh, as, a, as a rough outline, which enables people to then think and to build on what has gone before rather than thinking of this as a, as a once only opportunity. And within the policy guide, we've put in lots and lots of signposted resources uh, so that people can find information to support decisions. They can find some of this data that perhaps they didn't know about. Uh, we've put in case studies so that people can see examples of what has been done in different places. And in each case, we suggest uh, different areas of government that could perhaps take a lead in a particular area and others where they should be looking to support decision making. And so again, trying to emphasize that this is not something that people can do alone. Uh, this is something that needs widespread support and stakeholders working together. And of course, we've also provided things like explanations of key terms, uh, which sometimes stakeholders can be very confused by what we mean by different terms. And again, encouraging people to look at what is the next step? Whether you have an adaptation plan at the moment, whether it's about implementing your national adaptation plan, or even at the other end of the scale where you don't have an adaptation plan at the moment, what can you do to take one step forward? So it's very much about um, encouraging and, and enabling people to take that next step, whatever that might be. So thank you very much. And uh, our state of knowledge report and the policy guide is available from the uh, HVT website. Uh, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to discuss them uh, a little later on in the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Carrie. Thank you, Andrew. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, can I remind you, please put them in the Q&A chat. Um, you see there below your screen and we can come to them after the next presentation. Now, moving on, our second presentation will be given by Tim Durant, who's an Associate Director at Vectors. Tim will be presenting findings from the Transitions Project, which is looking at the role of informal transport in a low carbon future. So Tim, uh, could you put up your presentation, please? Thank you very much, Gary. Hopefully you can see the presentation and hear me now. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, well, uh, hello everybody. And, and thanks very much for the, the opportunity today to present about the, the, the transitions project. Um, I just uh, make sure I can get through the slides. Here we go. Um, so just to provide some background about this project, uh, it's it's a, again a, a HVT project funded by UK Aid, which looks focuses on in the role of informal public transport uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. So we're looking at the current role of this mode of transport in 
in a number of cities and looking at future possibilities for improvement. I'm sure many people on the, on the call today will have their, their own experiences of, of using uh, these informal transport modes in, in different cities. In, in my case, uh, riding using matutus in, in Nairobi. We also hear of cases about where uh, there, are, there are proposals for major transport schemes, such as bus rapid transit, to be introduced in cities. And this can result in resistance from the, the current providers of these informal transport services. And, and this is understandable when you think that these larger public transport schemes may take away people's livelihoods and jobs. So we're interested to look at the continuing role of informal transport, how this can be protected in, 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 in the appropriate circumstances um, and, and supported in the future. Uh, so as you can see from this uh, motivation and ambition slide, we're looking at transitioning the policy debate, stakeholder relations and informal transport services. We have a focus on, on around climate mitigation, but acknowledging also, of course, that local air pollution is, is, a, is, a, is a major issue in, in cities. How we continue to provide affordable, affordable mobility uh, with these modes of transport while retaining employment and, and improving safety. So we acknowledge that there are nevertheless problems with these forms of transport but there's, there's potential for, for continuing support and, and, and improvement in these, in these services. So, as I mentioned, the, the, the project uh, is actually focused on Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and at the beginning of the project, we, we identified a number of research cities to work with. As you can see, the, these are arranged around uh, a Western Africa cluster which includes uh, Accra and Kumasi in Ghana and, and Freetown in Sierra Leone, as well as the Southern Africa cluster uh, with Cape Town, Maputo, and uh, we originally started the project involving Harare, but actually just shortly after the beginning of the project, then a, a ban was implemented on uh, informal public transport in the, in the city centre area. Uh, which somehow underlines the, the purpose of the report to understand what are current attitudes towards these modes and uh, should they be further supported um, by, by public authorities also. Uh, the, the statistics on, on, on the left in the table just show the, the, uh, the modal share that these, that these types of minibus transport, the informal public transport has. And as you can see, in, in, in many cases, these are, these are over 50% of trips. So, for, for people traveling to work, uh, people also working in the informal trading sectors, for school children, for government officials, many people use these, these forms of, of, of transport across sub-Saharan Africa. So during the presentation today, I'd like to give you a, an update on the status of the proje pro project, just showing you some of the findings that we've reached through the different phases. Um, as Gary introduced, I, I work for a company called uh, Vectos, and, and we've been very pleased to, to be partnered in this project with a number of organizations with, with uh, a lot of knowledge in the subject area and local expertise in the city. So we've been working with uh, the University of Cape Town and Transitech, who are work package leaders. Uh, also, um, an independent consultant, Jeffrey Turner, has been providing input on gender and social inclusion issues in relation to these transport modes. And then we have other local city researchers, the Sierra Leone Urban Research Center, Gautier Moz, uh, based in uh, Maputo in Mozambique, and then also the uh, Knust University, Science and Technology uh, University in Kumasi. So we, we began the project back in August 2020, and it's running through until the, the European autumn in, in 2022, in October. And we've been undertaking the work in, in three main phases. So first of all, we undertook a, a literature review covering, covering uh, reports and academic literature for, literature for Sub-Saharan Africa. We've then, we're that now reaching uh, the end of, of phase two, which has been primary research in, the, in, in five cities. As I mentioned, these are, these are arranged in the two clusters. And, and moving into phase three, which is development of a route map tool and beginning our to, to spread the word about the, the research we've been doing. So just to start with the literature, literature review, 
Uh, and so, first of all, it was important for us to uh, define the scope of what we were looking, the research we were undertaking. The term informal transport covers a, a wide range of, of transport types from motorcycle taxis and three wheelers up to the types of minibuses that you see in, in the picture here. Uh, we have decided to focus on uh, what, we've, what we're presenting as informal public transport. So these, this means that uh, when a passenger take, uh, uh, uses one of these services, they're not able to determine the route and the destination on their own. They're traveling with other passengers who may be getting off, on and off at different stops. And we also wanted to, to, to focus on the larger vehicles and minibuses and larger cars, which are yeah, able, able to provide greater capacity and therefore provide a degree of efficiency in terms of how the, the street space is, is used. So working on the literature review, it was felt this was an important starting point for the project as there hadn't been a, a literature, literature review of this nature for Sub-Saharan Africa for, for some time. And we found over 300, uh, we worked through over 300 publications as, as a team. And as you can see that we worked through both covering uh, thematic areas, as well as uh, looking at the, at this time of the studies, the six cities that were involved. So uh, in the pie chart, it shows there, the, there's been a lot of work on regulatory frameworks and operating practices for, for the, uh, the informal public transport sector. Uh, emerging themes are those such as digital platforms, so, so the idea of uh, uh, digitalization of information available and mapping of, of the services that, that are available in the city, as well as uh, things like cashless fare collection uh, and, and, and the introduction of those types of, of uh, services in, in African cities. And then there are other themes such as gender and inclusion of, of, in this area that have had relatively little uh, research to date. So, and this is why we were keen to, to, to also incorporate this, this aspect within the project. What you do also see from this slide is that the, the interest in this area of, of research is, is, is growing, particularly in, over the last 10 years, you see that the number of publications is, 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 is really increasing, um, which is certainly a good, good sign. Uh, another thing from the literature review was that we noticed there's been a, there's been a certain amount of focus in, in particular countries, as you can see, South Africa, uh, Kenya and Ghana have received most attention, um, whilst other areas are, have relatively little research or, or have not been captured in, in the literature review at all. Um, so this is something that we'd like to begin to address also in our, in our uh, dissemination phase by speaking more with cities that are still shown, uh, sorry, speaking with cities that are still shown white uh, uh, on, this, on this map. Uh, what we did find from this literature review was uh, many beneficial practices that are worth learning from. So for example, there's the, the Digital Matutus uh, Initiative uh, in Nairobi, Kenya, which has been mapping the, the services across the city. Again, in, in Nairobi, there, there's been the setup of savings and credit cooperatives, which uh, enable better working conditions for, for drivers as well. For example, offering them, a, offering them a, a salary rather than depending on reaching certain targets uh, during, during a day. Uh, we see for the improvement of vehicles, recapitalization and renewable, pro renewal programs, such as in Cape Town and in, in uh, I recall there's another scheme in Dakar. Um, and then we see initiatives like city centre vehicle size restrictions to try to reduce congestion. So in, in Dar es Salaam, for example, it's be, it was possible to encourage the uh, public, uh, the informal transport providers to use larger vehicles and to support that move to bigger vehicles in the city centre area to help reduce congestion by many smaller vehicles. So the, this uh, first stage of work was also very beneficial for us to start to outline what would later be our, our research uh, framework and, and, and route map tool framework, which I'll come back to later in the presentation, and to define where we wanted to focus our, our primary research in, in the five cities. Uh, the literature review is, is written up in a compendium report, which is, is available on the, on the Transport Links uh, website, the HPT website for download. 
We've had some positive feedback and for anyone interested in this topic and in particular in relation to sub-Saharan Africa, then I think it's, uh, it does provide a good thematic overview and, and points you in the direction of other good reports and literature on, on, on different topics as well. So uh, really recommend to have a, have a look at that if, if you can. So now we come to, to phase two and what we've been undertaking in terms of research across the, the cities. Uh, this presentation, in this presentation, I'll focus on the findings that we've been seeing for, from Accra, because we're still working through the process of, of analysing all the results. But there have been three main activities that we focused on. Uh, we've undertaken stakeholder interviews, uh, trying to make sure that we, in particular, emphasise discussion with the, with the industry itself, the informal transport industry, but also ensuring that we speak with uh, government officials as well as others involved, such as uh, those that finance vehicle purchases or provide fuel. Um, we've undertaken passenger opinion surveys to understand well, what, do, what do people think about these services? Do they have other op options? Um, because there is, a, there is a threat that the, the minibus services that are currently in place could be replaced, for example, by more by motorcycle taxis, which are in turn even more uh, polluting uh, than, than the minibuses them, themselves. And then also looking at fuel consumption surveys to see what is, what is the current state of these minibuses, how are they operating, and is there potential to, to improve the efficiency and fuel performance of these buses uh, through, through future actions. So just as I mentioned, to focus a little bit on the, on the findings from Accra in this presentation, through the, the stakeholder interviews, we, we've, um, we, we've gained some insights into the interactions between the government and, uh, and the industry. So just to provide some background on, on, on the structure uh, here in, in, in Accra, uh, there's an estimated 300 uh, Trotro minibus terminals in the, in the wider metropolitan area. Uh, we focus our research working with uh, two of the associations or unions of, 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 of transport op of, of the uh, minibus operators, um, as, as, as mentioned here, uh, to, to understand their, their opinions. And, and we focus the research, as, including the passenger opinion survey, around two terminals of these, of these two associations as, as well. Um, so it was Interesting to hear that, a legal, that there's a legal requirement for them, for the minibus uh, operators to register with the union or association, and they do receive benefits from that. So greater assurance of operating at full capacity on certain routes, uh, then extra um, sort of welfare benefits for them as drivers and their fa families, as well as training and support. But nevertheless, that there is a, a growing presence of, of, of what's called floaters, other minibuses other minibus um, operators that aren't registered um, and in fact there's a, a felt to be an oversupply of this this type of transport in the city and that of course leads to congestion and increased competition and therefore uh, less income for providers um, we, we've also seen in, in in accra a situation of municipal fragmentation so by this we mean uh, in around the period 2011-2012, then the administration was devolved or, uh, to, to 12 district areas, but only six of those retained, uh, uh, or only within six of those, there was a transport department set up. So clearly there became a, uh, a regulatory void, but also an enforcement uh, void in those other areas. And then later the districts were further subdivided, which, uh, which uh, created that problem further. So it doesn't help in terms of the overall coordination across the city. There was an attempt to introduce a, a bus rapid transit scheme in, in Accra. And there, there was a perceived failure that the, the Trotro operators, there was the opportunity presented for them to become involved. But unfortunately, that, that wasn't, uh, didn't uh, materialize in the end to, to, to the extent that would have been hoped. Uh, so, so in fact, uh, after a short period of implementation as, as, a, as a high quality bus route rather than a full bus rapid transit scheme, then uh, the BRT scheme uh, has been yeah, failed essentially uh, and, and is, is no longer operating in that form. And competition from the, from the, the continuing trotro services was seen as, as, as part of that, uh, the reason for that failure. 
Um, speaking with the, the unions for, for TROTRO operators, it was felt that uh, there are improvements that the city could support with, such as improving the state of, of stations and terminals across the city, which would allow them to provide better services for their passengers. And we do see that there are areas where there is interaction between the state and, and the TROTRO providers. So uh, fair setting is one of those, and that's becoming, uh, with increasing costs of operating the minibuses, is becoming uh, an increasing area of concern. Are, are the other trade operators able to really operate their, their, their current business model or could they need more financial support? Um, we have seen a, a successful scheme in Accra of the Ministry of Transport offering uh, better rates in terms of minibus purchases, which could, uh, could be seen as, 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 as uh, a foundation for a further renewal scheme to improve the, the, the fleets that are operating in the city. So just to, just to run through some of the uh, passenger opinion and feedback, um, as you can see within each of the, within each of the cities, and we, we've received over 1, 000, well over 1,000 questionnaire feedback uh, from the two terminals and focusing again on the feedback from Accra. Uh, we see overall that, that there's, there's good satisfaction actually with the, with the overall positive uh, satisfaction with the TROTRO services. Uh, this may be because people they have limited other options, and and this and the condition and provision of these services is normalised. But of course, we do see the value of the, the mobility that is being provided in the city. Uh, one as sorry, I'll, I'll just continue there. One aspect where um, there's less satisfaction is in terms of the, the fair levels, and we see that the trojos are in. Uh, uh, particularly used by low and medium income uh, users and, and therefore the cost is, is, is a big factor. Um, but we also understand that the, the TROTRO providers may be operating also but within very tight margins. So, so the cost of mobility overall is, is, is becoming a, a, a big problem. Um, in terms of road safety, then again, perhaps we see that more people are uh, less worried by safety issues uh, using the trochos than we, we might expect. But again, this may be a degree of normalization that uh, people are, are used to using these vehicles and don't see risks. We do see there's a difference in opinion there between uh, women and, and, and men, uh, reflecting perhaps uh, um, more risk adverse attitudes, um, typically, typically among women. Um, and then we've got, to, and then we've had some feedback on the, the the particular aspects that do require improvement, and how the how the uh, Trotro unions and the government could work together on these. So some aspects are around drivers uh, g going too fast and perhaps driving dangerously, and whether there could be training in relation to these aspects. Uh, the, the stations and terminals themselves not being in a good state of repair, and perhaps this is an area where more investment could be focused by, by uh, public authorities as well to improve the conditions for, for where people have to transfer from one minibus to another. Um, and again, the issue of fares and the cost of fares has, has, has come up again in, 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 in terms of particular issues that need to be looked at. So again, useful to have this feedback from, from passengers. Uh, a challenging but very interesting aspect of the research has been undertaking the, the fuel consumption surveys. Uh, unfortunately, we're still working through, through the, the data um, that's been collected from these. This involved uh, attaching fuel probes to two vehicles and then also tracking their movements with GPS trackers. So there's a lot of work for us, to, uh, for the team to, to do in order to, to, to bring through the results from this. What we do see in Accra is that there's a variety of uh, vehicles used, and these are typically uh, second-hand vehicles imported from North America or Europe, in some cases being converted from, from cargo vehicles to passenger vehicles. And of course, this brings, um, they are older vehicles, so of course, we, we could expect that they're, they're not as efficient as new vehicles and that they are, they have higher uh, air pollution problems associated with them. The, the TROTRO operators have also referred to the condition of the roads being a problem. So even when a, a vehicle arrives in good condition, that they are that they're, that they're quickly affected by the, the road surfaces, um, and then of course uh, increases maintenance costs as well for the for the operators. 
So just, uh, I, I'm aware I'm taking up some three minutes. <laughs> so, sorry, Gary, how many minutes? About three minutes if you, uh, then we can have some questions. Absolutely, yeah, thanks. It's just the last couple of slides now. So, so we've been working through, um, working on our route map tool based on the research framework I, I mentioned earlier. And we, we, we hope to have the opportunity to work on this with other cities as well to, to understand the situations that they also face. So this starts with a, a four step process. So we start with understanding what, what are the current, what's the current context? and what are the current attitudes amongst policy and decision makers towards the informal public transport sector. So this involves um, looking at the, the current network ca characteristics and service offer of, of informal transport, as well as the benefits and, and the problems that it brings for the city uh, and get, getting a good overview. We then look at how the, the industry is organized. Um, this includes in terms of the, the financial models that operate and how this also affects labor conditions and, and remuneration for the drivers and other crew members. Uh, and we also look at the engagement context. So how, to what extent do, do, does the industry feel it can, can engage in, in, in policy and decision-making and mobility planning in a city? The, the third step there is about city capacity and capabilities. Um, Different uh, cities have are, for example, uh, enforcing license, different licensing and regulation schemes. They may be setting fares for, for, for the industry, but there can be issues around enforcement. And of course, enforcement uh, does require uh, a certain degree of capacity as, as well within a city. So when we're recommending actions, we have to take that capacity of, of, of cities into, into account. Um, and that brings us through to a, a range of different actions that could be taken. So these could be, for example, very briefly, uh, infrastructure actions, providing uh, improved terminals or, or dedicated lanes for uh, informal public transport services. Uh, there could be mechanisms to improve the fleet and, and fuel uh, qualities. And, and this is maybe something where the international, uh, international community can become more involved as well. Aspects such as business development and, and training for, for, for uh, unions and, and individual uh, vehicle owners and operators. And then also looking at the passenger experience, can we provide better information on, on routing and, and better, better conditions on, on, in terms of their actual experience of using these services. And just linking back briefly before I finish to, to Andrew's presentation, uh, it's, we see that, uh, in fact, our project is focused on the, the, the mitigation and reducing emissions, but we also need to think about the, the adaptation story as, as, as well here, uh, climate ad adaptation and the involvement of the transport industry in that. So here we could, we could think about involving the inf informal uh, transport uh, industry in terms of planning of uh, preventative measures. How do we av av avoid uh, dangerous situations and current in uh, from weather events or in pandemic situations, preparedness when those situations do occur. Uh, who is taking? Who should be taking? Um, yeah, who should be making those decisions? Also at the response level, um, what are the lines of communication there? If 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 a certain situation does occur, and then later on the recovery and learning from that from that experience also also through that stakeholder engagement and um, we see that the more we can we can invest in that first step of prevention and then preparedness then hopefully the less will will be required in terms of response and, and recovery so just just then the, the closing remarks from my side so we obviously the, the project is still in, in progress the research is, is largely com largely complete um, but we are we're looking forward to, to publishing more of the findings in the near future and undertaking that cross city analysis. We'll also be uh, planning some workshops where we hope to invite other cities, as I mentioned, those that perhaps haven't had so much research or support in, on this topic in, in the past. Uh, so they'll be taking place in Accra and Cape Town during July and, July and August. So if, if anyone's on the call today and is interested to, 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 to uh, be involved in those, then please do contact me. And just to say that we've had a, a good level of interest and, and, uh, through the, the stakeholder involvement in the cities we've been, we've been working in, and, and we're really appreciative of, of that uh, open approach uh, to, to stakeholders working with our, with our partners in the cities. So thanks again for the opportunity to present, and, and that's 
that's all from from me thank you thank you thank you very, thank you very much tim if anybody has any questions can i remind you to put them in the q a chat there the box sorry the q a box what I'll do, um, I'll go back to Andrew first, give uh, Tim a bit of a break, and then we can uh, have a look at some of the questions or comments that have been um, presented here in the Q&A box. So I think the first question is about the Met Office. While Met Office, Met Office data is quite detailed, any data on vulnerabilities is still in its relative infancy. What do you think is needed to help enrich data on present and future vulnerabilities? And I, presume, um, I assume that's transport vulnerability for the transport sector infrastructure. Thank you, Gary, and, and thank you, Michael, for the question. I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, of the three elements of the risk equation, the, the hazard, in this case, a, a weather climate hazard, uh, the vulnerability of the infrastructure and the consequences of potential uh, disruption of that infrastructure, the vulnerability is certainly the one where we often have the weakest data. Uh, so it is something which we've been tackling in a number of projects, um, looking at how you can use historical information uh, about disruption uh, to perhaps identify key elements of infrastructure which are particularly vulnerable uh, to different meteorological variables, because obviously there's not just one vulnerability, there's a number of different vulnerabilities. Uh, also understanding again, local knowledge, um, who, who can perhaps talk about some of the things that have almost happened, some of the near misses, which can sometimes give insight into vulnerabilities. Uh, and of course, we can learn lessons from other places. So uh, one of the projects I did with uh, Met Office was looking at analogies so if we can find somewhere in the world today that has the kind of climate and infrastructure that is uh, in a different place uh, and that that will see that the weather that it will see tomorrow uh, can we learn lessons from what happens in country a to help inform the adaptation plans of country b um, so that's another area where we can help to develop that information. And again, it's all about talking to people. It's about understanding uh, where there's sharing of information. Um, yeah, and there's another question about data sharing and how uh, information service across South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Do, do you have any comment on that? I guess you, there's a need for it. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, uh, and thank you, Manai, for that question. If I could just share Mm -hmm. um, so what, one of the things that we found is that um, often we can we can do a lot by um, signposting the information that is available. So um, here I've just pulled up the climate uh, the climate change knowledge portal from the World Bank, uh, which contains uh, for each country and region. I've just selected Kenya here as an example, um, but can give you detailed information about um, the climate classifications within within the country, uh, the observed data uh, for climate um, across a number of years, a baseline uh, climate, but also can then look at the climatology for the future so that you can begin to look at uh, different variables. So we can look at maximum temperatures uh, and we can look at uh, different time periods in the past but we can also look at the climate projections uh, for the area as well. So again, we can look at different scenarios. Uh, we can pull up regional information so we can begin to identify what is the, the, the effect on the maximum temperature. So we can look at extremes uh, and we can look at different regional areas within the country as well. And all of that is pulled together um, into reports. So there are reports for each country to do with the climate risk profile. Uh, so here is a full climate risk profile report for Kenya, uh, where they go through all sorts of different key sectors, um, which we can look at uh, and, and have data around. So often it's a case of um, helping people to find the data that, that is available for them. Uh, for their particular region. And again, if people are wanting to delve into that data in, in more depth, even more depth, uh, then of course, all of the, 
the major climate modeling um, organizations, so the UK Met Office, uh, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, uh, the US uh, Meteorological Services, all have their own models. And all of that data is available through the UN uh, ICC um, portals. So people can really get a, a, a massive depth of data. Uh, and often that is informing their local Met Office on uh, their local um, regional models as well. So absolutely, I agree that, that we need uh, good information sharing. Um, and, and we really do need to make the make good use of this data that's that's there. But a lot of it is there for people to delve into. Okay, thank you, Andrew. I'll because um, I'm wary of the aware of the time. We can some questions for Tim. I don't know if you had time to look at some of these questions, Tim. Um, there was the first one about BRT systems and how uh, can't cities construct BRT infrastructure but use the existing buses. Uh, somebody's replied to that. I don't know what your thoughts are. Um, yeah, I, I, I saw that question and thanks thanks very much for that. I, I think in a way that's, a, that's an interesting um, comment to, to, to the, the, the point at the main point of the project that um, where, you, where you're looking at uh, making a, a big change in the city, uh, clearing a route for, for a BRT, uh, a service and, and providing perhaps new, new vehicle infrastructure as well. This, this is a big project and it can take a lot of time, may have delays. So part of what we're looking at really is how could we work with the existing industry, the, exist, the existing fleet, as you say, but improve the conditions of their operation. And some of that will be about managing the existing infrastructure in, in a better way. And if possible, then providing improved infrastructure. And that could indeed include the dedicated lanes in certain areas. Um, if it's possible to enforce those, of course. Yeah. yeah, and here I think this is something that we spoke about that um, local transport in Africa will be fuel based for quite a while to the 2030s. What are practical things that can be done at scale to mitigate the impacts? Of, you know, so that's a, that's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, th and thanks very much to, to Brendan Finn for this, for, for this question as well. Um, this is a, this is a, an area we've been looking at. Um, there's there's clearly so, some interest around possible electrification of, of vehicles as, as as well in Africa. But as as mentioned in in the question here, this could take a, a long time to cascade through to uh, Africa based on the the current secondhand vehicle usage. Um, so in in the meantime, we see, see there are indeed opportunities to work. In fact, with, with the, the existing operators on better maintenance regimes, it could be looking at also the, the fuel supplies and improving fuel supplies with better quality fuels. So we feel that in the, in the short term, there are a number of activities that could be undertaken that could, could help to improve efficiency. Um, in certain areas, it may be also beneficial to look at upscaling the vehicles, particularly in, in city center areas. So. But first of all, I, as, as uh, just referring back to the question, then certainly looking at improved maintenance regimes could already make a make a difference. Okay, great. I'm aware of the time, so um, I just I would like to ask you a question, and this is probably to Andrew. If um, obviously we have these people here today listening to this webinar, what is the key message you want them to take away? If they could only take one message from the work, the presentation that you've given, or from your project, what would you like them to take away? Oh, uh, one message. Uh, <laughs> right. That's a that's a bit of a challenge. Um, I think no matter where you are, you can take the next step. Um, there, there is support there to start adaptation planning no matter where you are. So I'd like them to take that away as a as a, as a message to anyone that they meet um, and anyone that they work with. And your policy guide also, when will that be available for people to download? Is it co coming soon? Uh, I believe it should be on the HVT website. Um, okay. The state of knowledge report is definitely up and I'm expecting that the policy guide, if it's not already there, will be up very shortly. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then to Tim, a key message from your, message. From your presentation project. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, yeah, for, for, from our side then is to say, please, um, yeah, do, do watch this this space for, for the project. We I've I've given a very brief summary of, of uh, 
the, the findings from one from one of the cities. We have been working on five other cities, so we'll have a lot of uh, additional uh, output from the, from the project as well. I think uh, there's been a very good uh, comment from uh, a colleague from the project, Mama Monet, who's been undertaking the research in, in Accra. So we're not uh, just to say we're not saying that BRT is not appropriate, but uh, it's uh, it's really looking at what is also the role of the, the continuing role of the informal public transport sector and how can we better work with them in the future. Okay, thank you, Tim. So on behalf of the HPT program, big thank you to Andrew and Tim for the presentations today, which were really interesting. A big thank you to all of you who've attended this uh, webinar, our research exchange. Just to let you know, there'll be a number coming up in the next few months. So if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the uh, Transport Link uh, website newsletter. Um, we'll be sending a recording of this uh, session after the event. And I think maybe also if you can share some of the presentations, some people have been asking for that. So um, thank you again, everybody. And I think, uh, yep, yeah, 3.01. So I think we should uh, finish this webinar. So thank you and have a good day, evening. Thank you very much. Bye.